Okay, welcome to lecture 27 of PDEs. Today we will be looking at um, the KDV equation and solitons um, more generally. So, and it's kind of a nice opportunity to review some of the stuff we did in the beginning of the lecture. So that's actually how I'm going to introduce it, basically review all the properties that we've learned that's applicable and then show how this goes beyond it. Okay, so features about the KDV equation, it's, possib it's a fascinating equation. It's possibly, it's a higher order equation in space, so it's higher than what we've had, but we actually have already learned the techniques to cope with that. Um, it's a nonlinear equation, much as um, uh, Berger's equation that we solved. In fact, it is Berger's equation, and I'll just remind you of that in a moment. And the combination of these two effects resulted in a highly unusual piece of mathematics that is still being studied and resulted in new techniques that are also fascinating. So I'll give you a flavor of what this actually is. And it's also mainly just at the end of the course to give you an idea of what goes beyond basically the linear te techniques we've been doing for secondary equations in a very, very nice way. So as I said, it's not normally included in a um, PDE's course, but it is something I found and like very much, and it's something I tr work on every now and then as well. Um, and I'll tell you where that fits in as well. So just to summarize what I've said, it's nonlinear, it's third order, and the, third, the fact that it's third order this term results in something we call dispersion, and I'll tell you, ex sort of illustrate what that is. Um, and which is a phenomenon you see in other places as well. Whenever a, a wave actually travels through a medium, you also see dispersion. And in fact, the splitting of light by a prison is, a, is an example of dispersion. So it's a frequency-dependent change in the velocity of the wave that's traveling, basically. Okay, the mathematically interesting part is it has soliton solutions. So it's a new kind of solution that you have not encountered before. So in the second order systems that we studied, we had this idea of the Green's function and separation of variables and then various means of applying them, but those were the two major ones. It was this idea that because the equation is linear, you could then construct the solution of a whole series of basis solutions or, in fact, an integral of the Green's function multiplied by the initial condition. So there's this idea of linear combination of solutions to give you new solutions. And, in fact, if you had two solutions to the wave equation and you add with the right boundary conditions and you added them together, you would get another solution. So that idea of superposition um, is there for linear systems. Soliton solutions have properties that go beyond that and yet, surprisingly, are highly describable, even but with difficult techniques. Okay. Um, and seeing how that happens is kind of fun as well. The next thing is... It's exactly integral. So surprisingly, despite the fact that it's nonlinear, you can get exact answers on. You can work, you're going to work very hard, but you, there is a set of techniques that give you exact answers. And the way that these techniques work, I'll try and give you a flavor of. It's going to go way beyond the course, because the course on its own. Um, but it's fascinating how it actually works, as well as the person that had the conception of making it work in the first place. That's also fascinating. Um, and it shows you sort of the importance of understanding the basic stuff, and then you can see how you build on it and go further. So the reference, if you actually do want to go further, it's highly readable, which is why I just happened across this book the one time and started reading it, and usually this doesn't happen with mathematics books. Usually I like to read the little bit that I need to solve my problem or that might help me, and then I put it down and go to bed. But this one I literally picked up, and I took the whole book and I read it through because I just wanted to see. It was like a detective story of basically nonlinear dynamics, so it's a highly readable book. I recommend it, um, and it's accessible. It'll, it, it, because it com it com as you'll see when I sort of start describing it, it combines aspects of mathematics, but the mathematics' intuition that caused the next step was sort of a physical way of thinking about it. Very clear. Um, okay, so that's where it comes from. So now, in this first lecture, I just want to give you sort of a feel of how the stuff was discovered. Um, and solitons, 
were not discovered in mathematics. They were discovered by a guy who was riding his horse. Uh, very important. Horses are important. Um, uh, sort of in the 1800s along the Glasgow Canal. And there they have a lock system. Okay. And what happens with a lock system is you have a little square box. The ship comes in. Say it's below. It's like an elevator for ships. The ship comes in. They close the back. They then pump water in. The ship raises up. They open the front. The ship shifts, um, goes away. Then they're left with this little box of water. And so for the next ship to be able to ride in the elevator, they lift the, the back part of the box. And then you, have, you let the water go. So Russell was standing here on his horse next to this lock watching the ship being lifted and let go. It's watching the, the, basically the ship was lifted, the, lock was, um, the ship was let go, the second lock was closed, um, and he was there as they lifted this, the, the last lock. And what he saw was basically this hump of water <laughs> that came out of the lock, and it started moving. And he expected the, the hump of water to go splat, you know, just dissipate, like, because it's water after all, it's just going to flow and disappear. And it didn't. Okay. So he then took his horse and he followed the hump of water. Uh, and to his surprise, this hump of water traveled like five miles at the speed of his horse. You know, a tremendous amount of, um, uh, um, a tremendous distance. So I actually bring the quote, but I forgot to get it this time. So what he, d so what he did is he basically wrote a paper to the Royal Society, um, and this happened in 1834, reporting what he'd found, reporting that he'd been at this lock. Um, this had happened, he'd followed the wave with his horse, and this is why we have the story of the horse, because he actually wrote it in the paper. And to his surprise, this horse, the, the speed of the wave was roughly the speed of the horse, and it persisted. And he could not explain this, he was surprised at it. And this is the, the letter, I mean, back then observational science was tremendously acute and tremendously respected. Um, and it got published, and that was the beginning of solitons. And he called it in his paper a great wave of translation. In some sense, instead of going splat, it just kept going. And then he went, he was so fascinated by this thing that he saw with his horse, he went back to the lab and tried to create an experiment in which he could make a wave that would carry on going. Um, and he explored it further, and he basically, his experiment looked something like this. So he basically had a block just like the lock of thing of water, what he would do, instead of having the canal let the water go, um, he would simply drop the block in and then watch how the wave that was displaced moved. Um, he would change the side of the block, he would change the depth of the water, he would, um, uh, yeah, so he had various control parameters. He could also put a block in a stationary piece of water and then pull it out. Okay, and so his findings were um, that the higher, in other words, the bigger the block that you put in, the higher the waves traveled at a faster speed, which is not what we know of, of normal waves. Um, and he could write down, just experimentally observing these waves, he simply wrote down the speed of the wave in terms of these parameters, where these parameters are as follows. Right? He said that the speed of the wave is basically dependent on this, H, which is the depth of the water, okay, so that's the baseline water, um, plus A, which is basically the, the um, displacement from the baseline of the wave, and um, obviously scaled by G, right, if you were on the, um, on the moon, they would, uh, it would be less, they would go slower. So the, the main restoring force of the wave that basically keeps the wave sort of bounded to the rest of the pond is G, okay. So that's what he found, okay? Higher wave, faster speed. So he also found that the waves only occur in shallow water. So there's a point at which when the water gets deep enough, um, it doesn't happen. And he found that only waves of elevation are possible. In other words, only if you drop the block in did you get a wave. If you pull the block out, you wouldn't have a, a hole traveling, okay? We do have cases where we have holes traveling. We find them in solid state physics all the time um, when we work with semiconductors. So there are solutions. There are cases where you have that. But in this particular case, 
That's, there were no, no waves. So he was pretty complete in his description. Okay? In fact, he also said a wave of depression, what it does, it basically breaks up into a whole bunch of oscillatory waves and then it disappears. Okay? So there was a certain... So he, he did a complete analysis. Very nice. Then people went and analyzed water waves and took the Navier-Stokes equations, which is the full excuse me, nonlinear um, equations for fluids, the general ones, and showed in the case where you have shallow water, then it can reduce to something that they call the KDV equation. Okay. And so um, this hops a little few of intermediary steps, but the, basically the statement is they eventually found that the Russell's experiments, fluid dynamics could be reduced to this, this particular one-dimensional equation. The full Navier-Stokes equations are much more complicated. Like they have pressure, they have density, they have all sorts of things that can change. But the simplest thing that can be extracted in his case that was applicable is this KDV equation. Okay. So, and because we can now leave the physics there, now that you know the background and you know where it started, um, I'm going to look at the various properties of that equation and actually show you how these things arise. Okay, so first little, and this is why I said it was review a little bit. So the first thing is, let's go look at, so in lecture, what's it, one and three, we looked at the advection equation, right? And just to remind you, it was basically a linear equation, um, first order, where you could have the solutions where C is a constant. And we found that it was like just a wave traveling in the one direction, and if it was an arbitrary function, that was fixed by the shape of the wave. Okay, and so just a reminder, this is what we had. Okay, um, the speed basically fixes the way at which the hump moves. Any, any shape of hump can move, and um, it moves at a constant speed. Okay, and then we went on, and we said the long, if C basically is dependent on U, then we had that one equation, example of Burgers' equation. Oh, wait, before I go on, I'm going to, I'm going to take another, I'm going to take the other out. Okay, so um, I'm first going to do this linear, I'm first going to do the full linear equation, and then I'm going to do the, the nonlinear part. Okay, so this is the, the wave equation, the advection equation, and then um, uh, another, the other property that I said that comes from this term is dispersion. Okay? And I just want to give you an example of what that works like simply. Um, so the simplest equation with dispersion is basically an equation that looks like this. Okay? So it's got the advection part, and then it's got this epsilon times the third derivative. So there's our dispersion that comes in. And we actually have all the techniques to be able to solve equations like that um, because it's linear. And the techniques that we used with the Fourier analysis basically applies here as well. Okay? And the, the, we, so then what we basically do is we try and solve this equation in Fourier space and we replace the derivative with an algebraic expression in IK. And so, to give you an idea of what that does, is suppose you want to solve this equation on an infinite domain. You basically use the Fourier method, which we did in lecture 18, and you say, let, we can always write the, expand the answer, u, write it in terms of its Fourier representation, times e to the i k plus i omega k, omega t, times k d w. Okay, so that was our Fourier method, was basically expanding the u in terms of um, the Fourier basis functions with a coefficient that we compute. And um, so let's assume this, and if we substitute this thing back into that equation, what we get is simply that that equation then only works on this e to the i k plus i omega t part, and what we can get is, um, and yeah, and so what we can get is we can simply evaluate what the effect of this equation is on a single 
thing like this and look at the implications for our Fourier coefficients. So the method we be therefore use is we say, let's look at a, they call this a mode, just like the one vessel function is a mode and other things. So let's substitute a single mode into this differential equation. Okay. And what we then get is this I omega plus I k plus I epsilon k to the three. Right, so simply if you apply these derivatives to that thing, then you get that expression. Okay, so we now need to solve that. We know that u is not equal to zero, so obviously this thing must be equal to zero. And so what this expression gives us is much, very, very similar, in fact, an easier example of when we deri we're deriving the Green's functions. It gives us a relationship between this frequency omega and k, which basically is the wave number. It's a number of zeros in the mode you're considering. And so we have that now omega is not an independent function, but can be viewed as a function of k. Okay. Um, and this must be true for a valid solution. So we now have that we can write u as this function, we can write u that way, provided this function forces the fact that our dispersion relationships hold. So a valid so way of writing this is to say our Fourier coefficients are basically any Fourier coefficients for which this relationship holds. So we basically have this delta function that forces that relationship times another function g of k. Okay, but this thing is no longer just g of k and omega because the delta function then forces omega to be a function of k. So we can basically write it in the following way. We can say, put this g k of w back in here, okay, with a delta function, integrate over w, then our delta function forces W to, to have the expression of the, the dispersion relationship. So then the W that goes into the exponent is now omega, which is a function of K, which is that. And this G of, this G hat of K is G of K at evaluated at omega K. Okay. And we are interested only in the real part. Okay, so for a specific problem, this g hat of k is going to be chosen so that our initial condition is satisfied. Okay, so at um, uh, times t equals to zero, right, this g hat of k is simply such that we take the initial condition, f of x, the initial shape, do its Fourier transform, and that is what g hat of k is. Okay, so that the g hat of k is the Fourier transform of the initial condition, and um, then we actually have the solution. Okay, um, so we basically work out the the g hat of k, and then the full solution is this just this with this dispersion relationship. Um, and so some of the properties of the solution that I want to show you is the fact that this dispersion relationship makes a huge difference. Okay, so the first thing is, if epsilon is zero, right, the solution is effectively just a wave that's been translated. And you can see that because your, if epsilon is zero, your g hat of k is just the Fourier transform of the wave, and then you're simply this... Um, taking the Fourier transform back at a different um, uh, a frequency will simply shift the wave uh, systematically, so you'll get this translated wave. Okay, so to see how this actually differs from your and it's just wave that's being translated, we need two things. The one is the phase velocity, which is basically equals to omega k over k. That's just the definition of the phase velocity. And so for this particular example, omega k over k is just simply, sorry, minus omega k is just is simply equals to 1 minus epsilon of k squared. So if um, 
the, if epsilon is zero, it's just one. So it's just the, the speed of the wave moving. Okay? It's, this wave velocity is basically a proxy for the speed of the wave. And now a second thing is um, basically determines how fast the wave goes or an individual component of the wave moves. Uh, a second thing that we want is going to be a, called a group velocity. So this happens a lot in physics, but... And the group velocity is just d omega dk. So it's a derivative of the frequency with respect to k. And once again, it is 1 um, uh, minus the 3 epsilon k. So if epsilon is 0, once again, the group velocity is simply 1. Okay, so for a, linear, for a wave without dispersion or anything else, you just have these two velocities being 1, and it just trans is the wave that's translating at constant speed. And so that, just to connect with the physics stuff, determines the velocity of the wave packet in physics. Okay, so a lot of these methods, there's a very close synergy between it and what we've seen in physics, and a lot of them actually appear in quantum mechanics as well. Um, this is just a simple example, and all of them can be basically reduced to this trick of expanding on the Fourier basis and having the dispersion relationship. It appears in many, many places. Um, it also appears a lot of in optics, which is just pure light waves. You have, whenever you pass a light through a, a dense medium, you have dispersion, and then they use the same type of analysis as what I'm using now. Okay, so you have this idea of two velocities, um, and it's basically how long a group of frequencies stay together. So if uh, epsilon is zero, the group of frequencies remain unchanged. And... Um, as a result, it's also how long the shape actually stays together. Okay. So let's have a look here. So this is, once again, the example I've just been doing. Let's say it has a Gaussian initial condition um, because you can always do the Fourier transform of a Gaussian. <laughs> um, it's just a Gaussian again. So that's why it's my favorite example. So you have this... This initial condition is your Gaussian, and it's a very natural shape. Um, your Fourier transform of the Gaussian, which I derived, I forget in which lecture, is just this thing. Um, and so our solution is just the real part of this Fourier transform times e to the i k x, and the previous one was minus omega t, but if you, omega t is just equals to k times cp. Okay. And I'm writing this because I want to then use, generalize it. Okay, so that's our solution. And if you can see over here already, this is where that translation basically comes in. Remember, and I've written the solution in the way um, where it's basically... Um, very, very similar to the advection equation because if CP is a constant, then this is just that function of X minus C times T. Okay, so that's why it was written this way. Um, and, but it's not necessarily constant. It, has, it can depend on K squared in this case. And so what I've done is there's you can actually just plot this thing. You can plot the linear one analytically. Otherwise, you can actually ask the computer to invert the Fourier transform because it's basically you get your Fourier transform, which you have analytically. You multiply it for a given t by this expression, and then you basically or you multiply it for a given t by just the t part, and then you take the, the inverse Fourier transform to go back. So there are, it's very FFT in MATLAB and all of those things. Well, you would have seen it in the things, in your image processing. Um, and so let's see what happens if epsilon varies um, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.5. And um, so what I have here is um, if the two are the same. So in 0 0.1, right, you basically have, um, here is your initial condition, your phase velocity, and your, what's it, I can't read even my own stuff. You have your 
CP and your, your group velocity and your phase velocity. So they lie basically on top of each other. Um, and, oh, so that, sorry, that was if epsilon, pop, pop, pop. Okay, so if, eps, if C is equal, if epsilon is equals to zero, that's the case. So that's just your advection case. Um, if epsilon is 0 0.1, that's your case. So your um, group velocity is inside your phase velocity. And if epsilon is 0 0.2, your group velocity is also inside your phase velocity. So this is just what the actual functions are that are being used to make the solution. And so if it's 0.5, it gets even more extreme. And so what this tells you is basically what frequencies are going to do. Okay. So the first thing to note is the CP can go negative. If, okay, for a normal wave that translates, it just is moving in the one direction, it's a positive speed. Um, for, for a wave that has dispersion, you can have some part of the wave with a certain set of frequencies moving positively, and then you can have the others starting to move backwards. Okay, and so that's the new thing that intru gets introduced. And so if you look at the initial condition now, Right there, when epsilon is zero, no part of your wave is moving backwards. Okay, as epsilon increases, here most of your wave is still moving forward, except that oh here, so here most of your wave is still moving forward. Right, none of the initial conditions have their um, frequency such that they have a negative speed. So this is the basic thing. So the idea is you take your Fourier transform, you get your initial condition. Then you look at it. Then you look at your dispersion relationship. And the C determines which of the modes are going to be moving forward and which of them are going to be moving backwards. And so if your epsilon is small enough, you still, it still basically looks like a wave that's, trans, that's going forward, except that over here, these frequencies that are extreme, they're going to start doing something else. And these guys over here are going to move with a slower speed than what the central thing is actually going to move. Okay. And then over here, you have the more extreme case that all the modes over here are actually going to move backwards. So you're going to have your initial condition, it's going to break down into a group of waves that move forward that keep the shape, and then this tail bit that starts going the other way. And um, it just gets more extreme. So let's look at what it actually does if you make the solution. So here we have the case where epsilon is equals to 1. So you had that case where this blue line was basically out here. At times t equals to 0, it's the same initial condition we had. And it moves at times 0 0.t. So it's basically just the wave moving. It's changing its slight shape somewhat because some of the low frequencies things are not quite moving as, sharp, as fast. Um, and a little bit of them are starting to move backwards. And so as time goes on, it basically does something like that. So the part of the wave that's moving backwards, you can see results in this tail, whereas the majority of the thing is just the hump moving forward. Okay, and this gets more extreme as you go to epsilon goes going to 0 0.2. So there you can see the, 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 it's almost, almost immediately the group moving backwards is starting over here. And um, its amplitude decreases, okay, and it basically does that. So it's a basically, and that's why they call it dispersion. It's basically your initial wave that just goes... Right, it gets more and more spread out and more and more flat. And the bigger epsilon is, um, the more dramatic the effect. So here's epsilon equals to 0 0.5, just to be super extreme. Um, and there you can see almost instantaneously you have a large group running away from you. Um, and um, yeah, it's also moving slower on average. 
right, so it's actually disappeared. So this simulation, look, was taken much longer than this other one. Okay, so the group velocity, which is this red G, is basically a measure of how, well, how fast this dominant feature is going to continue moving and is much slower. So you, can now, you now have an intrinsic or an intuitive feel of what dispersion does. It makes a wave go splat. And it tends to, instead of keeping it bounded and together, it tends to disperse it out. So spread it over the, um, the, freak, the, the spatial space because you have the components moving backwards in the frequency space. Okay. Um, actually, ironically, some another application of this, the Fourier thing over here, if you do image correction where you've taken photographs through a murky, um, uh, like a murky thing, then you actually take the Fourier transform and put a filter on that fixes this. So because it's lin a linear effect, you can fix it. And the DOM, and when we have pulsars, um, dispersion is also tremendously important there because you have the pulse being initiated initiated light years away, basically. It travels through. It measures every single little molecule in the way, and every molecule causes a dispersion. And so your high-frequency components, just as over here, travel faster than your low-frequency components. And so if you want to make a really sensitive detection, we actually, the way we search for pulse shells is we look at the data, and then we apply the inverse filter for various dispersion things. So we basically try and line the pulses up. We basically try and get our initial condition out if we're given things that look like that. And so when we and so what we do is we get our data, we try, we do a Fourier transform, and then we try various corrections to try and get our initial spike out. And the place at which we get the maximum spike out we say is our dispersion relationship. Um, and then, and it remains fixed for the pulsars unless they move. If they move and they become a, behind a cl dust cloud, it changes again. But on average, it remains fixed. And that dispersion relationship, the number we get out, then tells us, gives us an estimate of how much stuff there is between us and the actual object. And people use that to actually map out the stuff, like uh, an estimate of the dust and the stuff that the light travels through. We have lots of pulsars spread over the galaxy and over the basically in our galaxy, and we actually have used it to map out where the dust clouds are because they are such precise clocks. So, application, very nice. And it's exactly this Fourier thing, a filter that inverts that, that idea. So that's also a cool application. Okay, so dispersion does this. Um, now, the second part of the thing is... The, just to remind you, and I think I'm going to stop there before I start um, the, the intense analysis and do, do that. Then you're going to have two lectures next week, so that it will be, would that be okay? Okay, and then I'll tell you, then, then I can like go slightly more slowly over the next two lectures, which is necessary because the stuff's intense. Okay, just a reminder, Berger's equation, what does it? We did it in lecture three. Um, we had that very nice, fully general method of solving first order PDEs, and you could write down the implicit parametric solution where you had u as a function of x minus ut, where u is still unknown. And we had this case using the characteristics. We had this idea of you start with the initial condition, then. Uh, um, then it moved, the higher um, amplitude part of the solution moved faster because the slope of this characteristic line was greater. And so eventually any initial condition would lead to a shock wave where the solution would no longer be multi um, single valued. And um, we said one way of overcoming it was by means of shock waves. Okay. You had a jump discontinuity, so eventually this wave would just go and you have this triangle moving forward and you solved one of the problems with the gen or try to in the, the <laughs> in the test whether you have the tri generic triangle moving forward. And so it's typical of non linear PDEs and usually when you see a PDE like that you know you're gonna get shocks and that's it. Um, what makes the KDV equation so unusual is that it doesn't happen. Okay, so in the KDV equation, look there, you have exactly 
Burgers' equation just with a constant there. And you could actually write it exactly as Burgers' equation um, if you rescale the uh, u. Okay. But what happens is this nonlinear part, and this is what once Russell had discovered this property of the waves propagating, people started looking, they derived the equations, they started looking at it. And the properties were fascinating. This nonlinear part with dispersion, which makes the wave go splat, fights with the one that may, wants to make it break. And it fights precisely. It's a very even battle. Um, and so what basically happens, the dispersion and the nonlinear velocity um, fight against each other and prevent the shock from forming. Okay, and it's this fight that uh, lets the, the wave propagate through and retain, it becomes an entity. It like is a feature of the equations and that's what comes out in the analysis. And that was only discovered because they knew what they had to look for. Um, and that's how solitary waves are formed. At this feature, solitary waves only occur where you have dispersion or sometimes other things fighting with the nonlinearity. You necessarily need a nonlinearity and you necessarily need something that's going to smear it out and counteract it from being basically becoming a shock. Okay, so that's what they call solitons, and the KDV equation is completely integral, which made it the prototype, the simplest prototype example in which these things could be studied. And um, it's very, very rare, right? The other place where it appears and has never been fully solved is in Einstein's field equations. So another place of, and but it's more complicated because it's basically not one unknown, it's, it's two. And some people think it's a way of view black holes as that, right? We have no, besides like the one, the, the Schwarzschild solution that you're familiar with, um, and the Kerr solution, uh, we have no physical analytic black holes that move. Okay. Um, the equa there are equations that are, have been shown to be integrable um, that can be solved the same techniques as the KDV equation is solved. Nobody has ever solved them analytically. So, which is the reason I'm interested in them, okay? And which is the reason why uh, this KDV, when I, when I, I mean, you sort of le learn GR on its own and, and you, you, you introduce the classical solutions and you, you don't know how to think about black holes because you know these waves. You can show you, you can show you the black hole solution, you know their waves. Um, but how do you put the two together? They've only solved it numerically. And then when I came across this book about the PDEs, that's how I went. <laughs> um, it introduced me to ideas that most of the field don't think about black holes. There are a few. But the equations are so difficult that nobody, I think, has ever applied some of the more general techniques to the black holes because it's risky and because a lot of people, it's basically publish or perish, they don't go there. But I do believe it's possible. Um, anyway, okay, so um, what I'm going to, I'm going to finish the slide and give you, the KDV equation actually appears a lot of places. It appears not only in shallow waterways, it appears in nonlinear optics because of, it's the simplest equation that arises when you, that has nonlinearity and dispersion. So it's a, a lot of equations can actually be reduced to it. And in fact, if you have a physical problem that has um, those two properties in, you actually look for the KDV equation, because if you can find it, there's a lot of results you can then use to analyze the problem. And so I'm going to mention some of its disguises and then stop, Okay. So one of the way to try and look at the whole class of solutions that give you the KDV equation is to ask the following question. Suppose we change the X variable, so the Indian variable in space. Suppose we rescale the time variable. And suppose we rescale and move the value of U, so the dependent variable. The question is, what class of solution or what class of equations will then be related to the KDV equation? And so we can use that to basically write down a, lot, a whole class of solutions that are related to it. And so if you get a nonlinear equation and you look at it um, and it falls within this class, then you immediately know that it's the, the KDV equation. So the way we do it is, so alpha, beta, gamma, C are constants, and you basically put that assumption, you put you, you solve for you, 
you solve for t and you solve for x, do the change of variables, put that assumption back into the KDV equation. And then you get basically that any equation that looks like this can be reduced to the KDV equation. So it's just a useful analysis tool when, or an equivalence between types of equations that actually can give you the KDV equation. Okay, so it's just a check to sort of help you make a bigger net for the application of the, the results. Um, and uh, so for an example, if you have, if you come across an equation that looks like this, that you just at first sight would say, oh, it's not the KDV equation. Um, it is actually, and you can basically show it's equivalent to the KDV equation if you set those constants as follows. You can do the transformation between the KDV equation and the initial equation. Um, and if you have beta equals to gamma to the 3, the reason I gave you this is a nice introduction to finding the first solutions, ironically. Uh, if you have beta equals to gamma to the 3 um, and alpha equals to 1 over gamma squared and c is equals to 0, you can get back to the, um, the original KDV equation, right? So this thing gets you to that expression, is the general way of getting you to that expression, and this particular case is the general way of getting you back to the KDV equation. Okay, so um, a way of saying this is that the KDV equation is invariant under um, translations, um, okay, so, the, so another way of saying it is um, if you do, uh, the KDV equation is invariant under this thing. Okay, so what happens there is if you do this transformation over here to the KDV equation, right? So if you do this particular transformation to the KDV equation, you're going to get back exactly the same equation. Okay, and what that means, so this is why I actually gave the, the longer introduction, is that the moment you have any equation that you can do a transformation like this and you get back the same equation, it's an indication that you have a similarity solution. Okay, so it's a trick. Um, you basically, it's one of the tricks of looking for similarity solutions. You simply, you take your equation you do the general rescaling of the variables and linear rescaling and possibly moving of the solution. Okay, so you make that assumption, you work out the consequences, and then you see if there are any parameters, choices, that would actually give you back to the original equation. And if the answer is yes, then you most likely have a similarity solution. Okay, and so the answer is yes for the KDV equation if you make this choice. And you can check, verify it yourself. Okay. So it indicates a similarity solution could be possible and um, in a similar way to the way we solved the diffusion equation in lecture 15. Okay. And so I'm going to stop there and next time I'm going to find it. And the amazing thing is just as a similarity equation in the diffusion equation played a very crucial role. Um, so it is actually plays an important role in the KDV equation as well, and it's the easiest way to actually get to an analytic handle on what the solid bond solutions are. Okay, so but that is for next week. Um, questions at this point? Interesting. Okay, <laughs> cool. <laughs> I love this stuff. So yes, thank you. So I'll see you on Tuesday.